It was almost exactly one year ago when Panasonic announced their first box-shaped camera, the Lumix BGH1. And today we have another box-shaped camera from Panasonic. It is the Panasonic Lumix BS1H. Oops, that's the BGH1. <laughs> This is the BS1H, sorry, got it wrong. So we are going to have a look at this camera in this video. I will tell you what it is and share with you some of my test results as well. Kia ora, good morning everyone, what you want here, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to have a look at the Lumix BS1H from Panasonic. And just before we start, I want to mention the camera I'm using is a pre-production model running pre-production firmware. By the way, if you are watching this video just after the camera is announced, I'm going to do a live stream which I will talk about this camera as well as some other products and there's also a giveaway as well. So check the link below. I would love to see you guys at the live stream. Okay, so what is this Panasonic Lumix BS1H? As I've mentioned at the beginning, Panasonic released their first box shaped camera BGH1 last year. It's a micro four third camera that has some features that we have never seen before on any other micro four third camera, but it also has no screen and no grip. So now if you take that camera and swap the 10 megapixel micro four third sensor with a 24 megapixel full frame sensor from the Lumix S1H and add a few small upgrades here and there and that's pretty much the BS1H. According to Panasonic, the BS1H is positioned somewhere between the Lumix S1H and the BGH1 in the cinema camera lineup. So this is very important thing because this is not a camera that is designed for casual users, it's not for YouTubers, it's not for vlogging and it's definitely not for photographers. It's a camera that is designed for video production that someone want a small camera or want to create a multi-camera setup or for live streaming or even attach it onto a drone. So it is a very different kind of camera. And I said the sensor from the Lumix S1H because just like the Lumix S1H, the sensor also has a low pass filter in front of the sensor, unlike the Lumix S1 or the S5 that does not have a low pass filter. Having a low pass filter would help minimize the moray effect and false color. So yeah, that's pretty much what the BS1H is. Okay, now let's talk about the body design a little bit more. I remember when Panasonic first told me the BS1H has the same body as the BGH1. I thought they mean the same kind of boxy shape design, but then they said, no, 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 it's the exact same body. It has the exact same height, exact same width, and virtually the same depth. The BS1H is 0.8 millimeter deeper, and that's because the Elman French distance is 0.8 millimeter deeper. So yeah, it's virtually the same body as the BGH1. All the buttons and other control layouts are almost exactly the same apart from some very minor difference that I'm going to talk about very soon. So what it means is if you already bought some accessory or built a rig that is designed for the BGH1, you can use them on the BS1H as well. The body of the BS1H feels extremely solid it feel like a metal brick. The weight of this BS1H is 585 grams, so it is only about 40 gram heavier than the BGH1. There are a couple of buttons at the top of the camera and also a control dial, which is the only dial on the camera. Most of the buttons are positioned at the 45 degree edge, which means you can assess it or see it from either the side of the camera or from the top of the camera, which is very important because the camera is quite likely to be mounted on some kind of rig instead of being handheld. There is a front telelam at the corner of the camera here so that you can see it either from the front or the top or the side of the camera. There's also another telelam at the back of the camera. 
So the telelamp not just tell you whether you are recording or not, but it will also display different status. For example, it would be flashing in red when the battery or the memory card is running low, or it will be flashing in green if you are powering it using PoE+. If you look at the front of the camera, there are some differences compared to the BGH1. We now have four customizable function buttons on this side of the camera and there's also a new operation lock which help you to prevent you from accidentally changing any of the settings when you don't want to. There are a total of 11 tripod screw mounts on the camera. You have three at the top and three on each side and two more at the bottom. So you can attach the camera to a tripod in many different ways or you can install accessories or cage very easily. If you have been shooting with Lumix camera for a long time, you will find using the BS1H a bit familiar, but also a little bit different. And there are two main reasons. The first one is the manual system. The manual system on this BS1H is very similar to the typical Lumix manual system, but it has been modified a bit to suit the BS1H design. For example, there is no photo mode because the camera is not designed for taking photos. So instead, the first menu is for you to choose your recording mode. So it may take you a bit of time to get used to it, to figure out the differences and also some of the new settings. But I think everything makes sense. So I think you will get familiar with the menu system on this BS1H quite quickly. And the other reason is the camera has no screen at all. There's no LCD screen at the back, there's no EVF, and there's not even a small status LCD screen like the one on the G9 or the S1. Apart from turning on and turning off the camera or start shooting video, which is very straightforward, but if you want to change any other setting, it is a lot harder without any screen. So. Unless you are really good at memorizing the menu system and able to press all the button sequence correctly without any visual feedback, you will need to attach an external monitor or use the Lumix Sync app or the Teetering app, which I'll talk about later in this video, when you want to change any settings. I know this is the whole point of this camera that doesn't have any screens or the grip, so it has a different form factor. But I do really wish there is a screen, even a tiny status LCD screen would be great. Quite often, I just want to check my settings to make sure, for example, the shutter speed is set correctly, or I want to see how much space is left on my memory card, or maybe I just want to do some quick changes, for example, changing the shutter speed or the aperture. Right now, I really have to attach a external monitor or connect to the app to do any of these things as I don't want to change any of the setting incorrectly. And another thing I want to mention is even when you have an external monitor attached to it, since you don't have the touch interface and there's no joystick on the camera, a lot of things like changing the focus point is not as easy as it usually is. Yes, there are some customizable buttons that may help but it seems like the camera is really designed to use with the Lumix Sync app or the Tethering app as part of your normal workflow. But if you use any of this software, then controlling the camera is pretty easy and straightforward. Let's talk about the input and output that is available on this camera, as this is one thing that makes this camera quite unique and powerful compared to most other cameras in the market. First, we have the dual SD card slot on the side of the camera. They are both UHS-2, U3 and support V90 cards. And just like pretty much all the other dual card slot Lumix cameras, you can choose to record to both card slot at the same time or do relay recording. And the camera also supports hot swap so you can continue record as long as you like. And if we look at the back and on the left side here, if we remove this cover and we have the usual microphone and the headphone jack here and below here we have the ethernet port and this is a very special and important one because this ethernet port can be used to 
transfer data or remote control and also supply power to the camera if you connect it to a PoE Plus hub. So if you are planning to set up your camera in a studio setting, this single Ethernet port could be the only port that you need to use as it can handle everything for you from powering the unit to transfer video and allow you to remote control the camera. At the bottom right side of the camera, we have a USB-C port here. This USB-C port doesn't support power delivery as the camera already has plenty of options for you to power it. Instead, it can be used to connect the camera to the computer for tethering control. So if you are filming in a location that doesn't have a LAN setup, you would use this USB port instead for remote control the camera and maybe also do the video streaming as well. Below the USB port, there is a full-size HDMI connector. This HDMI connection can output up to 4K60, 10-bit 422 signal. So you can either use it to just connect to an external screen, or you can use it to connect an external recorder to record high-quality 10-bit or even raw video footage. And now let's have a look at the top right. At the top here, we have a 3G SDI connector, which can output video signal up to full HD 60 frames per second at 422 10-bit. The SDI connector is mainly for you to connect an external screen, as the BNC connector is more secure than the HDMI connector. The signal can be transmitted potentially up to 100 meter. And another reason is when you are recording, the camera can output to both the HDMI and the SDI port simultaneously. So you could use a HDMI recorder and a SDI monitor at the same time. This is especially important when you are recording in RAW format, which I will talk about very soon. But when you are recording RAW, the HDMI is basically just outputting the RAW signal that is from the sensor. So you cannot see the menu screen and of course there's no overlay information. But you could get all those if you connect a monitor to the SDI port. You could also record internally at the same time even when the camera is outputting the video signal to both the HDMI and the SDI port. That means you could record your footage both internally and externally at the same time as well as you can have another external monitor attached to the camera. But there is more. And when you are recording, you could also externally connect to the tethering app through the USB or LAN connection or the Lumix Sync app wirelessly. But just not both the tethering app and the Sync app at the same time. So this really gives users a lot of flexibility in terms of how you can connect and control the camera and do the framing at a video production set. And below the SDI port, we have two more BNC connectors for timecode and genlock. If you are shooting with multiple cameras, you may use the timecode to synchronize the footage from different cameras and the BS1H support both timecode in and out. But if you need perfect time synchronization, then you will need to use genlock, which is also supported by the BS1H. Genlock basically means all the recording devices would wait for a synchronized signal to arrive through the gen lock connection. There is a bit for every single frame, so it can guarantee that every single frame is perfectly synchronized and wouldn't drift, no matter how long your recording is. There are multiple ways you can power the BS1H. First, there is a supplied AC power adapter, which you can plug into the back of the camera. This is the best option for shooting at location where you have access to AC power. But if you are shooting at places that you can't plug in the power adapter, you can power it using one of the Panasonic AG3BR batteries. This is optional, so you have to purchase the battery and the charger separately. By the way, these batteries are huge and they last much longer than the typical batteries on other Lumix, Elman or Michael Forford cameras. I was doing a lot of testing last weekend using just one battery and it lasts me the whole weekend without needing to recharge at all. And the third option is you can connect the camera to a PoE Plus Ethernet hub 
using an Ethernet cable to power the BS1H using power over Ethernet. This is great when your BS1H is installed at a permanent setup, especially if you need to connect the BS1H to the network anyway to do live streaming or remote control through the network. So one cable would do everything for you. The Lumix BS1H is part of Panasonic's cinema camera lineup, which means it is a complete video-oriented camera. And unlike the Lumix S1H, this camera doesn't even have a photo mode. By the way, there is a kind of secret way for you to take photo using the BS1H, but I will tell you how to do that very soon. The Lumix BS1H supports 8-bit and 10-bit recording internally to the SD card. Vlog picture profile is also enabled by default, so you don't have to pay anything extra to unlock it. The Lumix BS1H can also record video in quite a few different formats internally. If you want to shoot in 16 to 9 or 17 to 9 wide aspect ratio, you can record at 5.9K cinema 4K or 4K resolution at up to 30 frames per second with no crop. You can also record cinema 4K or 4K video at up to 60 frames per second in super 35mm crop mode. The Cinema 4K and 4K mode support up to 10-bit 422 output, while the 5.9K support up to 10-bit 420 output. If you want to shoot in 3 to 2 aspect ratio, you can record in either 6K or 5.4K resolution. 6K output's maximum frame rate is 24 frames per second. 5.4K output maximum frame rate is 30 frames per second. Both of these can output at 10-bit 420 format. Or you can also record anamorphic video. You can record in 10-bit 422 format at up to 30 frames per second or 10-bit 420 format at 50 frames per second. And if you want to record at a higher frame rate, you can record full HD video up to 120 frames per second at 10-bit 420 output. And that is with autofocus and audio. Also, all this recording mode has no time limit and since the camera has two card slots and supports hot swapping, you could in theory record forever as well. If 10-bit video is still not good enough for you, you can shoot raw video with the Lumix BS1H. The BS1H cannot record raw video internally, but you can connect and recorder using a HDMI cable and record raw video externally. The BS1H support both Atomos Ninja 5 recorder to record in the ProRes RAW format and Blackmagic Video Assist 12G HDR to record in the Blackmagic RAW format. So depends on which video editing software you prefer, you can use either of them to record RAW video with the Lumix BS1H. In terms of resolution, you can record in 5.9K raw video at up to 30 frames per second and that is using the full frame output or you can record 4k up to 60 frames per second or anamorphic 4k up to 50 frames per second in super 35 mil crop mode now since i have recently switched from using adobe premiere pro to davinci resolve for my video editing but i still using an atomos ninja 5 as my external recorder so i didn't really test out the raw output from the bs1 edge however i have previously tested the prores raw output from the s1 edge and i believe it should be virtually the same as the bs1 edge so you can check out some of the previous video that I have on my YouTube channel about the ProRes RAW if you want to find out more about that. One more thing I want to mention is if you are outputting RAW video to the external recorder, you cannot record to the camera's SD card at the same time. Now this restriction is only when you are outputting RAW video to the HDMI output. If you are just outputting 8-bit or 10-bit signal to the HDMI, you can still record to internal SD card. So you could record 10 bit both internally and externally at the same time if you want it. With the VLOG picture profile that is available on the BS1H, combining with the full frame sensor, that would allow you to capture 14 plus stop dynamic range internally. Have a look at this video that was captured in 8 bit output with the standard picture profile. You see, there isn't much details in the shadow area and pretty much everything outside the window is completely blown out. 
And now let's have a look at the video that is captured in 10-bit VLOG picture profile. There is a huge difference in terms of what you can retain in both the highlight and shadow area. And unlike the BGH1 that only supports the VLOG L picture profile, the BS1H has the full VLOG picture profile. If you compare these two videos, one shot on the BS1H and one shot on the BGH1, both shot at the base ISO with the same exposure. This is a really, really high contrast scene. I just purposely set it up to test the dynamic range. If you look at the box at the top right, I can get two different shades of white for the two different sides of the box from that video that was shot on the BS1H. While the BGH1 footage, both sides of the box are completely blown out. And if you look at the green box near the bottom of the video, the BS1H video, the picture on the box still retain quite a bit of details and colors around the highlight area. While the BGH1 video, the highlight is just completely blown out. When testing the BS1H, I noticed the camera can feel a bit warm after using it for a while. So I did a bit of test to see whether I could actually overheat the camera or not. I set the BS1H to record 5.9K 10-bit footage internally. The camera has a built-in cooling fan and I set the cooling fan to auto one more and I start the recording. When I start, the temperature of the camera was around 28.8 degrees Celsius. And every five minutes, I would measure the temperature again. I noticed the temperature goes up by about 2 degrees Celsius every 5 minutes and by 25 minutes it gets up to almost 40 degrees which is a bit warm but I have used many other cameras that can go much warmer than that so I was not too concerned. Interestingly, the temperature seems to have stabilized from that onwards and it doesn't continue to go up and actually the temperature is starting to drop and by 45 minutes when my 64 gigabyte memory card just ran off memory the temperature already drops back to 37.8 degree the reason why the temperature drops is probably because the building cooling fan on the bs1 edge starting to work once it reached around 40 degrees celsius and that cooled down the camera quite quickly and i said probably when it reached around 40 degrees because I don't really know when exactly the cooling fan has started working. And the reason is the cooling fan is very quiet. I had my MacBook Pro here in my room at the same time and the cooling fan on the MacBook is way louder which make me not really able to notice when the cooling fan on the BS1H has started working. I have to put my ear really close to the camera to check whether the cooling fan is actually working or not. In terms of autofocus, the Lumix BS1H continue to use the Panasonic DFD autofocus technology and it is the latest generation which has improved autofocus performance that we have seen previously on the Lumix S5 and other Lumix S series camera after the latest firmware update. For fast action, the tracking can still take a bit of time to catch up, especially when you are shooting 4K at 30 frames per second or slower frame rate. But for slow to normal movement, the camera handles it reasonably well. And as usual, if you increase the video recording frame rate, would improve the autofocus tracking performance. One big reason why people prefer a full frame sensor is because of its better high ISO performance. So let's have a look at the video quality when shooting at different ISO setting. From the base ISO all the way up to ISO 12800, the video footage from the BS1H is 
very clean. There is minimal amount of noise and the video retains very good details, color and also contrast. At ISO 25600, we starting to see some drop in image quality. When we reach ISO 51200, there is quite a bit of noise, especially in the shadow area. But I think overall, the footage is still quite usable. At ISO 102400, the shadow area, you can see a lot more chroma noise and contrast has also dropped quite a lot. And the maximum ISO 204800 is really for emergency use only. Now let's do some comparison with the Lumix BG-H1 and see how this Micro Four Thirds camera performance is when you compare it with the full frame Lumix BS1H. Interestingly, both camera has the same maximum ISO despite the difference in the sensor size. Up to around ISO 12,800, there really isn't that big a difference between the two cameras. The smaller Micro Four Thirds sensor on the BGH1 holds up really well when compared to the full frame sensor on the Lumix BS1H. From ISO 25600, the quality of the video from the Lumix BGH1 starting to drop quite quickly, while the Lumix BS1H footage still looks okay. At ISO 102400, the footage from the Lumix BGH1 is really not that usable and get even worse at the ISO 204800. However, one thing I want to point out is, unless you are shooting a scene where you only have one thing that you need to be in focus, or multiple things but everything need to be in focus are on the same focal plane magically, otherwise the Micro Four Thirds Lumix BGH1 has the advantage of giving you deeper focus than the full frame Lumix BS1H at the same aperture setting. You need to stop down the BS1H by two stops to get the same depth of field as the Lumix BGH1 when you are shooting at the same equivalent focal length. What it means is, in real world, quite often you need to increase the ISO on the BS1H by two stops compared to the BGH1 if you want the same depth of field with the same field of view. So now let's have a look at the comparison when I shift the video footage from the Lumix BS1H by two stops and see how these two camera compare with each other. Since I originally shoot the same ISO video at the same aperture and I stopped down the lens as I increased ISO, so after I shift the BS1H footage by two stop, the depth of field now matches as well. This is at least at the lower ISO setting when I can still stop down the lens on the BS1H. Now with this adjusted comparison, it becomes interesting. At the low to mid ISO, the two cameras are very similar. There really isn't that much difference at all. But as the Lumix BGH1 reaches ISO 6400, we're starting to see a bit of difference. The footage from the Lumix BGH1 is slightly cleaner and the difference becomes bigger as we go to higher ISO. When the Lumix BGH1 is at ISO 25600, the video quality starting to drop, but overall it's still quite decent. And it is definitely much, much better than the footage from the Lumix BS1H. Of course, it doesn't matter if your filming doesn't require deep focus, but if you do and you will shoot under very low light, the Micro Four Thirds Lumix BGH1 can actually give you better results once you adjust them to have the same depth of field. Next, I'm going to talk about a few things that make the Lumix BS1H special and different from most cameras in the market. The first thing I want to talk about is the Lumix Tether for multi-cam software. This software was originally designed for the Lumix BGH1 and now it also supports the Lumix BS1H. You can connect your camera to the computer using either a Ethernet cable through your LAN or a USB cable directly. With this software, you can check many things like 
the live view footage. You can remote control your camera. You can adjust the exposure settings. You can change the color profile. You can adjust the on-screen display. You can adjust the autofocus and you can see the results immediately. Basically, all the settings that you can set on the camera can be remotely controlled from this software. You can even shoot photo through this software. And this is the only way that you can get the BS1H to take photo instead of video. You can do this by selecting one of the photo mode from the theater software, and then you can take the photo from the software. But it seems you can only select JPEG, or at least I can't figure out a way to choose the raw output. But as the name of the software suggested, this software is also for you to tether and control multiple cameras at the same time. You can control up to 12 Lumix BS1H at the same time, but I only have one BS1H with me, so I can't demo multiple BS1H connection to you. But remember, I do also have a Lumix BGH1 with me, so I try to connect both the Lumix BS1H and the BGH1 to my computer. And yes, the software can detect both and allow me to connect to both at the same time. I can switch to connect and control any of the connected camera one at a time, but I can also choose to control all the connected cameras at the same time. So for example, I can easily change the exposure compensation on all the camera at the same time, or I can start filming all the cameras at the same time by just clicking one button. Oh, there's one thing I want to mention. Panasonic is also releasing new firmware for the Lumix G9, GH5S, and BGH1 at the same time. For the BGH1, there are a bunch of new features, including Blackmagic raw external recording support, but it also allow you to control the power zoom lens remotely using the Tether software. Definitely go check out the new firmware if you have any of these cameras. One thing I do wish I can do is to monitor the live view video signal from all the connected camera at the same time. As right now, I have to switch between them and can only check one video signal at one time. But anyway, even without that, this Lumix Tether for Multicam software is definitely very useful software for those who want to have a multi-camera setup and being able to control all the cameras from just one computer. With the Lumix BS1H, there are multiple ways for you to do video live streaming without having to buy a video capture card. The easiest way is to use the Lumix webcam software and use your camera as a webcam. This setup is very easy and you can use this method in most live streaming or video meeting apps. This solution is also available for many other latest Panasonic cameras. And I personally use this solution all the time with my Lumix S5 to do video meeting and also some YouTube live stream as well. I have a video that show you how to set up the Lumix webcam software. I put a link below that you can check it out. The downside of this option is that you cannot remotely control your camera from the computer and also the video quality is restricted to HD resolution at 30 frames per second. Oh, and the audio from the camera is also not transmitted as well, so you need to use a separate microphone for the audio. The second method is to use the Lumix Tether app combined with software like OBS. You also connect the camera using the USB cable and the quality of your video stream will be similar to the first option. And you also can't get audio from the camera. But with the Tether app, you can remote control your camera and also you have more flexibility in terms of how you set up your video. You can combine multiple video source and do a lot more in OBS. And the third option is to do IP streaming through your LAN connection. This option would give you the best video quality as you can get up to 4K 60 video output. You also get audio and you can also remotely control your camera. You can either use the same computer or different computers to remote control the camera and do the RTP, RTSP stream to your live streaming software like OBS. So it is suitable for both one-man band live stream setup where you are controlling everything yourself or you have a bigger production where you have someone to control your camera or cameras and then another person controlling the live stream separately. 
This Lumix BS1H is a really interesting camera. When Panasonic released the Lumix BGH1 last year, I guess we were all kind of expecting that we may see a full frame version of that camera in the future. But I wasn't expecting to see one that quickly, especially the company is also developing the GH5 Mark II, the GH6, and probably something else in the background over the last year. Reviewing this Lumix BS1H is a bit like meeting an old friend again. The camera's body design, feature, and controls are all virtually identical to the Lumix BGH1, but with the new full frame sensor. And I finally now got a chance to try out the Tita software with a multi-camera setup this time. I only have two cameras, but I can already see the potential of this system and being able to control them all from one software and do high quality IP video streaming is just amazing. I know it is probably a bit of overkill, but I personally would love to have a setup like this in my room here so that I can have maybe two or three BS1 Edge mounted somewhere in this room and all of them sync with Timeco and Geno and I just control everything from my desk here. So that would be an awesome and very easy to use setup. Comparing the Lumix BS1H with the Lumix BGH1, the Lumix BS1H certainly has quite a few advantages. You get better high ISO performance, you can get that shadow depth of field look that a lot of you like, you got more bokeh and better dynamic range and some smaller changes like the operation lock at the front that is also great. But I don't think this new Lumix BS1H would make the Lumix BGH1 obsolete. I believe for many users, the Lumix BGH1 may still be their better choice. Michael Forfer still has a much larger collection of lenses that is available and a lot of these lenses are really small. And also with the new BGH1 firmware update, you can now control power zoom lens remotely which the Elman doesn't offer. And while the Lumix BGH1's high ISO performance in absolute number is not as good as the full frame Lumix BS1H, as you have seen from the adjusted comparison footage earlier in this video, if you want to have the same depth of field, the Lumix BGH1 actually performs a bit better than the Lumix BS1H if you have to shoot under very low light. I guess my point is, the Lumix BS1H is not really a replacement of the Lumix BGH1. Just like the full frame l mount camera is not really replacing the Micro Four Third system. Yes, they do overlap a bit in a lot of cases, but there are definitely pros and cons of each system. And since the Lumix BS1H and the BGH1, they share the same kind of connection and have the same software support, you can set up a multi-camera system that use both systems to enjoy the benefit of each system.